Gus, John, welcome to the Potential is Human podcast. Now you're somewhere completely different in the world to where I am. And you and I initially met, or at least crossed paths, we could say, on a online retreat with Rupert Spira. Do you want to tell us where you are calling in from and just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm from Melbourne, Australia, and um, I guess I can start by saying that I was born in Venezuela, in South America, and I moved here when I was 10 years old. And yeah, I don't know what else to say. I what make was music. That? Yeah, what was that transition like for you in terms of being a young boy and moving from Venezuela to be in Australia? It was exciting. Um, I didn't really understand the full reason why, just because I was a bit young, but it was a big change. And but I was excited. It was a positive feeling attached to the big transition. Amazing. Gus, at 19, uh, you told me that you experienced the loss of an intimate relationship. And this was essentially a catalyst for your awakening. Now, that's a big topic and one that I'm very grateful that we can actually explore together. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And what was your firsthand experience of what you would call awakening? Okay, yeah. Um, I remember the relationship ended. Mm -hmm. And it felt like bigger questions were starting to arise inside because I had unconsciously attached a sense of safety and happiness. And when it ended, it felt like the, the safety net was gone. So that made me really question where to find happiness in a permanent manner, not in something that can end basically overnight. Um, and at that point, moment of my life, I was grieving the relationship, but also grieving this existential question as well. And that somehow drove me to some spiritual or non-dual books like Eckhart Tolle's Power of Now. And it felt like I could sense the truth that was written in them. And one night, uh, I sort of asked for a permanent shift because I, I knew that some aspects of my unconscious behavior were harming people and myself. And I, I just wanted a, a permanent shift um, instead of falling back into those unconscious patterns. And it, it happened when I asked for it. And it's hard to describe, but it felt like my mind went completely quiet and I had disappeared or it felt like part of me had disappeared. And that was the beginning, I guess, of this radical transformation that started to happen inside me where I, I would burn up a lot of emotion that was coming up and I would start feeling energy inside the body. And a lot of my mind patterns were changing as well. Mm -hmm. There's so much that we could look at together in what you're saying. And it's it's so powerful. I hope somebody hearing this, I'm sure some will relate. And I hope others will start to really lean into what you're saying because I fundamentally believe that it's it's why we're here, right? To discover the essence of our true nature. And you said you asked for it. I want to just touch on that. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Like, was it a request to a greater power? How did that unfold? Yeah, it's, it's strange. It, it must have just looked like I was just talking to myself in my room, but I did say it out loud. And I don't know what the thinking was when I asked it, if I was asking to, to a greater power or something, but uh, it was, I guess, half of a, a, a questioning as if, can I please have this, but also half determination. It's as close as I can get to the describing it, I guess. Yeah, thank you. 
you also said that you started to look for happiness in a more permanent position. Now, Rupert would say that you are the happiness you seek. And we know that majority of society still seeks that sense of happiness in the form of objective experience, right? Things outside yes. of us, people, places, experiences, events, substances. And that is so fragile, but we see it at a certain timing, right? On our, on our own journeys. For you, that fragility was in the loss of a relationship. So what you were saying is, so much of your sense of happiness and safety and security was in somebody outside of you. And in a moment when that is no longer there for you, you're left in this sense of, I would say, some sort of turmoil or turbulence. Definitely. What guided you to look within to source a permanent sense of happiness? Because without the pointers, the teachers, the gurus, the guides, how did you start to make that understanding for yourself that actually this person is now no longer a part of my life i need to look for happiness within myself yeah um i guess it was a long process from the first realization that i wasn't going to be find permanent happiness in something so fleeting and then I guess a period of time where there was a lot of suffering and a lot of emotional suffering, I mean, and for a long time, I didn't have an answer of to look within or anything like that. But I guess the suffering drove me deeper within myself and to realize that that possibility is a lot closer and a lot more stable than um, most people would look for it. And just by chance or synchronicity, I found myself listening to Eckhart Tolle and Rupert Spira, and uh, they seemed to draw out that intuition in me that was flowering slowly. What a beautiful way to say it, flowering. Yeah, How long have you been that's... on the path, Gus? Uh, obviously, you've permanently been on the path because it's the pathless path, but consciously, how long can you say like, this experience happened and you've been doing the work and looking within. Yeah, well, um, 2017 would be around the time of the loss of the relationship. But I remember noting down the exact month in which the awakening experience happened. And that was June 2017. So around six, seven years now. Yeah. Gus suffering part of that journey right and such a fundamental requirement for us to look for another way or to turn within what is your understanding of suffering you've mentioned the word a few times now and maybe you can just shine some light on how you interpret suffering and how you navigate suffering as well from this position that you can now witness and understand the suffering yeah Suffering to me means the lack of realization of ever present happiness. So a feeling of lack or fear fundamentally, um, and then a lot more feelings can arise from that anger, resistance and sadness. Um, it's when, when you are unconsciously identified with those states, I would say suffering arises mm -hmm. and perhaps how I view it differently now is, um, after the change is that even if you're having turbulent emotions of fear or, um, sense of lack of pain, emotional pain, um, there's still a presence essentially behind all of that, that is unbothered. And from that perspective, there is no suffering. Hmm. 
what you're saying there then is something which I guess all people would love to really know experientially for themselves. So somebody who's listening to your words, Gus, and says, yeah, but Gus, I'm experiencing lack, anger, I'm frustrated. Uh, life is very uncomfortable on a daily experience for me. What is it then that you're saying? Are you guiding that person to something far deeper that they might not yet be aware of? Or how are you saying somebody can interpret these disturbances or emotions? Yeah, um, I guess it would depend heavily on the personal circumstances of the person because I can say that a lot if you're in a really uh, dangerous place uh, or extreme living conditions, maybe that wouldn't apply as much. But I will say that for the most part, suffering is comes from a misperception of the present moment, basically. So you can catch a lot of a lot of the time, um, you can catch yourself thinking about the past or the future and becoming emotionally distraught about things that aren't happening in the present. And a lot of fearful thinking works that way, what's about to happen. Hmm. But if you look closely, the present moment doesn't have anything scary happening. And um, a lot of everyday suffering has to do with the anticipation that something will bad will happen that isn't happening now. And I can see that after the change in myself, um, when I've perhaps felt myself going into a state like that, that uh, just become present and grounded again. Do you have any particular practices that you use or follow in order to support you to anchor into the space of presence and not be pulled away by the ever-changing tide of experience? Sorry, what was that last part? and not to be pulled away by the ever-changing tides of experience. Yes. Um, I will say after the awakening experience, it felt like the presence became permanent. Uh, so even in circumstances where I felt myself getting taken over by an emotion, there was still a sort of background presence happening. So in some sense, that's the biggest um, way that I, I don't find myself identifying again with those states. Um, but I realize that's not, uh, very common to happen to people, but, um, I, I also realized that after the awakening moment, I started taking up formal practices like meditation and, uh, I did Tai Chi for a bit. And I believe that if that is regularly practiced, uh, enough presence, so to speak, will be there when those emotional states would draw you into unconscious reaction. And um, less, you'll become less identified with it. Thank you, and, and super well said. So in terms of meditation, uh, I know certainly on, on this side of the world, you know, and globally, there's been an explosion in mindfulness, in meditation, for somebody who might be hearing you for the first time and now hearing about meditation, what would a gentle guidance from you be with regards to how to go about meditating and what meditation is? Yeah, so meditation can be very different. There are different methods for different sorts of people because what I personally do is silent meditation, which I just sit down and become alert inside. Um, it's very, that's very simple. There's nothing much more to it. Um, just as sort of inner alertness and quietude while I meditate and then things may arise, emotions and feelings. Um, and that's very peaceful and very, very joyous. But there are other methods that don't, silent meditation isn't for everyone. So guided meditations are also very good. And that basically means someone is guiding you a voice talking um, to you uh, to guide you through the medit meditation. 
and a lot of a lot of people like that prefer it to silent meditation and then there are other ways uh you can do it if you want to be more dynamic with your body you can do tai chi which is very slow movements of the body and perhaps yoga as well there's sort of at least in my eyes there are ways in which you can use your whole body to become to cultivate that sort of inner alertness inside i really hope that somebody listening does resonate with that because what you've just pointed toward is in incredible in terms of supporting our journey of self-discovery call it expansion growth gus you're a musician and that mm -hmm. excites me so much when i first heard that um before we dive into being a musician, you've mentioned that there's an immeasurable depth of love and joy within us. Now, when I hear you speak and the quality of where you speak from, I understand that that presence, which you've also spoken about, is that immeasurable love and joy. Now, when you're playing music, this then is the function of this immeasurable love and joy being expressed through you. Exactly. Have you always been a musician? Tell us about your mus musician career, your journey, and just what music actually means to you. Oh, what a great question. Yeah, so um, I've, I think I always liked music because of an influence of my father. He, he would love music and he would always um, play music in the car and at home. And I think that cultivated a certain interest towards music. And as I grew older, the, the interest in listening to music stayed, definitely. Um, I would listen to good musicians and all that. And eventually, I would say maybe around ages 16 or 17, I started really experimenting with my own skills to write music. Previously, I had um, studied instruments as well but it wasn't for music creation it was just to get good at the instrument um and so at that age i started making my own music and uh this this i guess you could say was before the big awakening experience so there was already a an, uh, an intrinsic interest and deep love of music there um but after the awakening, it felt like it was obvious to align this that I loved so much that my body mind was so good at with expressing the feelings of deep peace, love and joy. And in doing that, hopefully the listener, not just myself, but any listener can be, can have a taste of that expression within themselves. And it's been a, a real uh, determination to just create the best music I can in order to do that. Mm. And so, yeah, it's very joyful and loving experience. And we're blessed to have you who's so talented that we are able to listen to. So maybe tell us where can people access your music? How can people get in touch with what you create? Yeah, sure. So. Uh, I just go, my musician name is my regular name. So Gus John. Um, and I think my music is on almost all the popular platforms. So Spotify or Apple music or, um, YouTube as well. I'm not sure what else, but it should, should be there. And, um, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Gus. Tell us when you're playing music, what is the experience? like for you so i play music and instruments as well but i also make music electronically so which do you mean do you mean both or let's go instrumental first just because i feel like the, the texture of what an instrument provides is not what electronic provides but electronic still is experience of its own so from an instrumental yeah. side when let's let me ask it like this when gus picks up an instrument and so it all begins. What is that like for you? Yeah, so it starts probably with a subtle feeling of inspiration. Um, 
and it does feel like I'm connected with an impersonal force. And from then on, it's, uh, well, let's take the piano because with the piano, I feel like I, um, it's a more versatile instrument to write songs with. Um, well, to be honest, it probably has to do something with song creation. So I would um, just look for a expression to the current mood, I guess, that I was having. So for example, I remember once I woke up from a dream and I had a tune in my head uh, in the dream it was playing almost involuntarily because it's a dream. You don't choose uh, the contents of your dream. But then I woke up and I retained the mood of the dream and I try to translate it into the notes and make the best attempt possible to transcribe the mood or the inspiration. And within that, there is freedom to take the journey in whichever way you want. And a lot of the process, at least for me, is very spontaneous. And just because you have an initial image of what it is, doesn't mean you can't become creative within that and change it. And uh, that's, that's part of the fun. Yeah. It sounds like an incredible amount of fun, because I can be totally honest with you, there's zero musician in this guy's body mind so when i hear what you're yeah. saying i'm just like i want to climb into that um how does it differ for you instrumentally versus electronically or is it much of the same just translated differently yeah it's the same i would say the reason why i make a lot more electronic music is because i can be really precise with my ideas um whereas this there's a sort of barrier of uh, technique and practice you need to perform in an instrument the best way possible whereas electronically you can take your time and make the sounds that you have in your head really be reflective of what you have in your head in the computer and um but the process of of the same it's the of translating your current emotion or your feeling or whatever wants to be translated out. And I think particularly over my last few years of making music, I've really become surgical with try to, trying to exactly transcribe what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. Gus, you used the word spontaneous. That's something which for me is like that sums it all up right it's like when you're creating how much thinking is happening around what notes to play next what follows or is it just a spontaneous expression and again I, I do want to try and stay anchored in a certain type of dialogue here but there's when it's that spontaneous Gus isn't playing music music is being played through Gus and that just yes so tell us is that thinking subsiding when you're playing is it stopping are you worried about what notes are following or does it just happen yeah it's a, a very very focused process so there's not a lot of aimless thinking about the past and the future if if there is thinking it would have to be aligned with the present project and what's currently happening and that's a very impersonal sort of thinking it has nothing to do with my personal life it's it's about aligning that with the creativity and then spontaneity of the moment um and i was gonna say something else but i forgot all good i do enjoy asking one question on these podcast discussions and i'm hoping that it's something that you're you're open to answering if there is anything to give feedback on but i find in in my journey so far that there's still this revisiting of old programs patterns emotions which arise that i could never expect to arise again or when they might arise what scares gus is there still anything which, which scares you in this life?
to be honest, there are some things. Um, in spite of them, I feel scared by them. I still, if I really go deep within, I'm not scared of them. Mm. But yeah, some some specific things like uh, nuclear weapons, for example, the fact that uh, these weapons can be used to threaten uh, civilizations and they're used as threats to end the lives of millions of people. Uh, that scares me a little bit, but deep down, deep down, I'm, I'm surrendered to it. And I can't say why, but if I really tune in with myself, I, I, I don't let it exacerbate yeah. into something worse. I understand. And that was never an answer, which I could have expected. I mean, it's your authentic answer. And I'm grateful that you said that because so often it's tied to still something, although that's a personal fear, but it's, it could be like the fear of death or, you know, lack and worry yeah. about financial future. And yours is just something on, on a global scale, actually, which is threatening to humanity. Um, Gus, let's try, let's try do this together. Non-duality. What is your ultimate understanding of non-duality and what would somebody listening begin to understand through what you can tell them about non-duality? Well, non-duality is very simple. It just means realizing that reality isn't divided, hence dual. And duality would be, I would say, a lot of people's first assumption about reality. Is that there is myself inside the body and i'm the mind and then there's the world and objects and other people so duality is simply realizing that that's not how it is that there is no division and sometimes a example i think of is thinking that a tree is separate from the forest in which it lives so if you identify a tree and you go that's a tree and it's an isolated fragment. You, you can conceptualize it like that. But if you look closely, there's no sense of division between the tree and a forest. It's just one. The analogy which I would often use for the same thing is the ocean, right? The, the wave is the water. The wave cannot possibly be separate from the vast ocean. Exactly. What that then brings us to is that there's, there's one awareness or there's one life force that is not divisible which is currently being expressed through what people would identify with as this ryan guy and then also gus but on an essential level there is no ryan and there is no gus we are just instruments in your case or body minds living out this expression of the individual awareness, which is everyone and everything. Yeah. Now that can be very difficult for somebody to grasp initially, but the beauty behind that is just, <laughs> it's so much love, right? Yeah. Before your big moment, what I want to ask you is that awakening and shift happened were you in a more fear-based reality and did you see yourself as separate that once upon a time or then? Yeah, definitely in a more fear-based reality. And um, my mind was just in crisis mode. Um, and yeah, unconsciously, I would say I, I felt myself as separate mm. because intrinsic with that feeling of trying to a attain happiness through an object is also the other side to it, which is, I'm an object that needs to be, uh, the happiness needs to come from outside of it, into it, in order to feel fulfilled. Mm. So what I hear there is that that view is that I'm an, I'm a separate self or I'm a separate object, which is not full. So I lack in some way, and then I need something to fulfill that sense of emptiness or incompletion that I believe I am. Yeah. As we shift, Gus, and as the journey unfolds, how have things changed for you in like daily experience? And I'm sure in, in massive ways they have. But from that more yes. fear-based separate reality to, to daily life now, 
how would you language the experience for somebody who might be listening and really wanting to grasp what we're pointing towards? Definitely. Well, the body mind was prior to the awakening experience was conditioned by this thinking and feeling of feeling separate from everything that includes, like you said, a sense of lack of I'm a fragment, so I'm not the whole and a fear based element, I think, as well of abandonment from the whole or perhaps of, of death, because as a fragment, you die and you're a temporary finite consciousness and through all of that all of those years of cleansing the body mind and the energies that ruled it which was very intense um it's like the body mind started to acclimatize itself more to the peaceful nature of our being when all of when the feeling of separation was starting to become dissolved. And I think ultimately that's all that needs to happen is the feeling to become dissolved in its own time. And again, spontaneously it's, and very seamlessly your body mind starts to express in your own way, the, the peace and love that you feel and that would um, culminate in better relating to people. Um, for example, in my case, I didn't analyze it too much, but I could tell it was a more empathetic and loving mutual connection between me and other people. Um, nature as well became a daily thing I experienced, basically just being able to look at nature from a quiet in in a space and seeing beauty and yeah seeing beauty in nature and also with cultivating the things that i already enjoyed so music for example i really started to focus on that a lot and it became really fruitful and sport is another and i guess most of all is the the peace that i feel inside uh it feels like it's been deepening and deepening as more of the, the feelings of separation dissolve. Mm. Gus, has anyone in your family navigated a similar journey? Or Although we are all on it in our own way, in some shape or form, um, often there can be, you know, we were born into a family where we might be very different in the sense that this is how it all un unfolds and plays out. Did you have this kind of understanding of, could we call it, and I don't want to make it too labeled, but spirituality, non-duality, self-discovery, awareness, is it part of your, your family? Is it part of the people around you? Not at all. <laughs> I <laughs> so thought that might of... be the answer. <laughs> yeah. So not at all. Yeah. And um, not even I was, you know, mm. not, not, no one in my family. So um, when that moment, it was very, that awakening moment happened, it was very bizarre. And a lot of that time there was confusion involved because I had no means to explain what was happening to me. Yeah. I can understand that that must've seemed incredibly difficult as well, because yeah. it's like, what, what's going on is essentially the question. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Gus, before we start wrapping up our previous guest, Mark Davies was on the show with me and he had a message that he wanted to leave for you not knowing who would be the next guest in your case you and not knowing how it may land or impact uh, your life but what mark had to say and i now know you know exactly what he means by what he has to share was just be your authentic self and have fun share from the love and the joy in your heart so that was from mark to you Gus, I've loved connecting with you. Uh, these discussions are not necessarily discussions we can have all the time yet. And I believe we will be able to more and more and more. So 
just from my heart to say thank you for making the time to connect. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. And thank you that we both can be on this journey and, you know, relate and bounce things off one another. I think it's vital for us to have that support. And I want to say you're a wonderful individual, but that would make you separate. You're a wonderful <laughs> expression of the essence of life. And I really value you sharing with us today. Thank you, Ryan. And I also have to say that I'm very appreciative of uh, your efforts with this podcast. And I think it's very important work that you're doing. And I loved being here as well and talking to someone with a similar, similar interests and about something I consider to be truly important. Thank you, Gus. It is so important. And also, I'm going to make your music a part of my day today. So when this podcast <laughs> ends, I'll be listening to you. And yeah, thank you again. Take care of yourself and just love from South Africa. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks a lot.